Kid, seriously. Welcome to a very special throwback edition of the Kid Seriously Show. The only show that usually prepares stuff beforehand, but then everything gets messed up, and now we've put me in a really bad position. Every so often we get together to discuss the world and the parts of it that happen to tickle our fancy, answer some questions that Kid Seriously got, and we're going to find a topic from Nerdland that we want to discuss further. To my left, it's everyone's favorite, it's Luke Neitzel, and to my right, it's... No one, because Mark is not here, and our special guest star that was going to appear is also not here. Much um, like Sean Maloney, he's too sleepy to perform. I don't get that. It's a fire joke. It's a fire joke? Yeah. Yeah. My life is fireless lately. It's a yellow fire joke. How are you, Luke? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I went to the fire game yesterday. Yeah, how was and it? And they looked awesome, and it was fun. And it was nice to go there and have it actually be fun, because that hasn't happened a lot lately this year. What's the latest with uh, the Section 101 and all that stuff? Nothing. It, really? Nothing, nothing's changed. No, I don't I don't think anything's going to change. It doesn't sound like that they are going to give them their section back. It's tarped off completely, all of 101. And there Why were... aren't they selling those tickets? I mean, well, okay. They, no, never mind, never mind. I just yeah. realized I asked the stupidest They're question. They're going to be selling those tickets, it sounds like. They're opening those up to the general public of season ticket holders to pick next year. I haven't gotten info. I paid my re-up back in the uh, spring because they ran a promo that was like, if you re-up now, you get to go to a practice um, with the players. You get entered into a contest to go to Munich when they played in Munich, and you got a special talk from Nelson Rodriguez, and it was actually the the day of or the day before he banned 101. Um, so I re-upped, but I haven't gotten information on what seats you can select or anything like that, so I was curious to see if 101 is on there, but it sounds like it will be. And Section 8 is still boycotting, and like they, they both have watch parties at bars, so they still watch the games, but there are members, like visible members, that are still there that you see, and this game had an announced 18,000, over 18,000 attendance, and it looked accurate to me. Like, that really? place was pretty full. And Section 8's section is pretty full, but it's, no one's, there's no capos, no one's doing chants. Like, most of the people are sitting down. It's just kind of like any other section of the stadium. So the LA fans, who came out in pretty big force, you know, they have audible chants going that are drowning out ours. Like they were chanting, this is a library at one point and make the playoffs <laughs> and stuff like that. So, um, but it was still fun cause we scored three goals on them and I tried to start a chant of welcome home Bob after we scored the third, but no one around me wanted to, oh. to join in, but it was a nice, Luke. nice little victory. Well, as for me, uh, uh, Papa Madrid was in town this weekend. We saw Avengers infinity war. Did did you think it sucked this time? What's it like no, this I, time? I liked it. You know what? Okay. So did he. Oh, did he? Had he, had he not seen it? No, he hadn't seen it. Has he seen any of those? Or? Yeah, he loves okay. Guardians of the Galaxy. He kind of the Guardians of the Galaxy is like his jam, which is sad because okay. now there's not going to be probably be anymore. Um, but he is watched as like a casual Marvel Universe fan, and he really enjoyed it. Because so. I always wonder how much that one would make sense. Because our our friend who canceled on us today, he we, canceled. We were talking about we're supposed that. Supposed to have him on my right. We were supposed to, but he's not here. He's sleeping. And he, he's tired. He doesn't like any of those movies. No. And he wondered about going to that movie, and I kind of in my head was like, you know, will it make sense to someone who doesn't like it? Like, they don't hold your hand and explain what's going on. Mm -hmm. But in the same standpoint, I think you could just watch it, and whenever you don't get something, just go, eh, comic book nonsense, mm -hmm. and move on, and you'd still be fine. Yeah, I think you're, you're probably right there. And, and, and again, I would like to apologize to you, to our listeners, to America and the world uh, for my original comments on that movie. I love that movie, and it gets better every time I see it. Like I adore it, and I was just tired. I haven't seen it a second time. I, I thought about renting it a few times, but I've just never it's, gotten around to it. It's unbelievable. Yeah, That's I really, so really should at some point. Hey, you know what else is good? What? Moving on to Am I Right or Am I Wrong? Am I right? Am I wrong? Or am I just dreaming? You're wrong. So we're going to get right to Anthony Dilweg's favorite game show. It's Am I Right or Am I Wrong? Here's how our one-player game is going to work. It's me against the world. Seven questions. 
And I'm going to go first, and I'm going to be the only one tonight. And um, eventually, if I or if I get to four, I win. And if I don't, I lose. Now, there's nothing on the line tonight, right? I'm still the number one contender. Yep. This isn't affecting if I lose. It's not affecting my... Record. How, what, what's the it's a practice here? round. Okay. So, you know, it's just your it's a training match while Mark is on vacation for the ninth time <laughs> in the last three months. <laughs> you know, for a guy trying to get out of his contract, I should show up, you know. You do. Like, whereas he's just kind of, you well, know, the, taking... The life of a trophy husband. And, that's, you know, that's hard. That's what you got to do. So are you ready to begin, sir? Yeah, I am ready. All right. Well, we're just going to dive right into this because this is a jam-packed one, and I already had to... Due to our guest dropping out where it was going to be a two-player match. Was there a guest that was supposed to be here? There was going to be a guest, oh my goodness, he's okay. sleeping. He's but tired. He's so tired. <laughs> Not now, Todd. I'm so tired. <laughs> but anyways, I had a, a, a fantastic 311-related question, but it's just not going to work anymore, so I'm going to have to kind of retool on the fly here. Okay. So we're just going to dive in that for the intro. and make this work. You know how I feel about my intros. You you take them very seriously. I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. So this whole show is probably ruined. Now it is. I, it I, a, I am not going to listen to it. <laughs> yeah. It was a substandard intro yeah, and everything we do now will be why degraded. It just puts me in a bad mood. Yeah. Exactly. Question one. Oh, crap. On this very show, we have discussed the thin ice that Kathleen Kennedy is on with ah! Disney. Yes. So the president of uh, Lucasfilm was on a roller coaster for the last few years. He's she's, had, she's had to fire multiple He's directors. Fire. And this summer, the Star Wars juggernaut took its first big loss Ooh. when Solo, a Star Wars she story, probably get fired, I bet. was taking a projected 50 to $80 million loss at the box office. Well, our predictions of Kennedy uh, being looking for a job soon have fallen flatter than Solo did, Good. as she just signed a three-year extension, yep. according to Hollywood Reporter. So when we look at, to date, Kathleen Kennedy's tenure at Lucasfilm, please assign her what letter grade her performance deserves. Okay, here's the thing. I thought that she would get sick of it and leave. Yeah. This is the right move. The, to re-sign her, she's made more than any producer in the history of mankind. She's been the most successful producer. Everybody gets a mulligan. Here's the facts. She didn't like the way that the movie was going for Solo. She just didn't like it because they were not following what she thought was a very good script. It was a dumpster fire as far as production, but Ron Howard came in and studied the ship. I love that movie. So even if it was a financial mess... Uh, I like the movie, and that's really all I care about. Um, she's extremely successful. I don't happen to like The Last Jedi, but you can't argue with... Her job is to make money, and Last Jedi made a shit ton of money at the box office. It's made a shit ton of money. Blu-ray, I'm giving her an A. All right. The, the correct answer is an A-, minus because you do have to be you disappointed. Minuses. Come on, dude. I do get minuses. That's bullshit. Yep. Okay. That's my game. So well, fuck. I think I actually started it so technically it's my yeah game. but i'm hosting today so it's my question and the answer is an a minus that's bullshit uh she she's made 4.5 billion dollars and the merch and that's just in box office returns so where's the minus the the merch has made billions i i still think that you should be able to make more movies more successfully yeah. than that not more successfully but like Less... The fact that they now have to go to a slowdown because they're worried about whether they're oversaturating it where their counterparts at marvel pump out three movies a year kind of kind of brings you down to the minus in my perspective so it, it hasn't been a perfect run like to me an a means everything's gone perfect you couldn't have done a better job well, you got an a, a. Plus. and she a could have oh, i don't give, i don't give a pluses i don't oh. believe in them oh god so so i, I give her an a minus she's done a great job but i'll, I'll let you have the point because that's that's cool hey, all right that's so all I'm i cared about in the end that's all that really matters exactly so We'll move on to question two, then. I'm about to get you're... screwed on the rest of these. <laughs> you may be, just because I may never get to talk. Oh, sorry. Jesus, I'm really, man. I'm excited tonight, man. You I'm are. sorry. Yeah. You asked me to bring the volume, and I'm bringing the volume, and now you complain. I feel like I can't do anything right. It's not, it's, it's not, I meant, like, the audible volume, like, okay. not the volume of words you would be putting out. So, yeah, question you. two. I can be a skeptical person. And one of the things I've been skeptical skeptical about is whether Dark Phoenix movie exists. And it's not just an Andy Kaufman style ruse to fool us all. Well, a trailer has come out. It has. And even though the release date's been pushed back I feel like a we're few gonna months, talk about this we we, we are going to talk about it. So we're not going to break down anything specifically from the trailer. Okay. But the Dark Phoenix saga is one of the most if not the most classic X-Men stories there are. And they already tried to make it once and completely fucked it up in X-Men The Last Stand. So, before we talk about the trailer later in the show, 
I want to know a story that you love that was adapted to the cinema after you had read it and they knocked it out of the park. Adapted after I've read it. Yeah, so you can't oh, have like... Yeah, God Loves Man Kills because they, they did a great job. I know it's a loose adaptation, but that's what I was going to go with. But I didn't read that until after... And it doesn't have uh, to be comic book. I know, it can be but anything. it's me, so it's going to be a comic book. Um, so they, like, let me get this straight again. That they adapted and they knocked it out of the park? Yeah, it was something you, you loved and were really excited for, and then you saw the movie version and you went, that was good. Uh, Civil War. Okay. Civil War was the... Because I liked the series, but I loved the movie, and so that would be the last one. Okay. That's okay. technically incorrect. Okay. Um, the, the answer I had is The Life of Pi, which is a, I a book I loved, which I didn't even fathom how they could make it into a movie, because mm-hmm. it's kind of such a weird off-the-wall topic to, to deal with and scenario. And I went and saw the movie and loved it. So uh, I, I give them the point. Civil War is enjoyable, but I think the comic kind of sucks. So Yeah, it kind of does kind of suck. I'm going to take a... Mm, yeah. T- t- take a point away from you there. But Yeah, you, I, uh, you're right. Comic you're, does kind of suck. you're one for one. I liked it at the time, but... So... This is where I showed up, right? Question three... And you're going to have to listen carefully, because this is a new type of question. Yeah. And I think this is going to struggle for you, be a struggle for you. So, Maya, if there's one thing that brings me utter joy, it's teasing you and your failed predictions and your dumb, crazy yes. statements. So, yes. you know, whether it's you wondering what Donald Glover has ever accomplished oh, to have people Shut talk about up. him, um, you know, back in February, or your thoughts that we've already touched on about how bad Avengers Infinity War was after the midnight screening... It's I was re- tired. It's really just something Much like I, our friend of the show. I never tire of, no. personally, is listening to, to those comments. But let it not be said that no. I am unwilling to give credit where credit is due, okay? A few weeks ago, I asked you on this very segment about the Batwoman TV show and when a major movie franchise would have a major LGBTQ character. Mm-hmm. You responded that you thought Marvel would offer us Miss America, America Chavez in one of their movies, and she would be it. So that doesn't appear to be close to her making her cinematic debut anytime soon. But she is making her debut. It was just announced on the Disney animated show Marvel Rising Secret Warriors. Really? Yes. Wow. So that is a good call on your part. Thank and you. that was a long shot good call. So we're going to count this like your bingo free space. Okay. You have 30 Fuck. seconds to talk about every, whatever you want, and I will offer you a point regardless of what you say, and I will also give no rebuttal to what you say. Wow. Well, um, let me uh, just go. I, I don't want to be mean today. I had a rough week this week, and I don't really want to say anything bad. What I'll say is that I'm really disappointed that our friend of the show is not here, and uh, but I'm happy you're here. That's all I'm going to say. Aw, well, that wasn't 30 seconds, but I'll give you the okay. points anyway. Thank you. So, well done. You're up two to one. Thank you. And good call on the uh, America Shop. I, like, I couldn't no, believe that when I read yeah. that this week that they were putting her in something. I was like, damn, that's, that's impressive. You know, between that and Stanley, tucky, touchy, touchy. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. And Ben Affleck's costume. Yep, I, yeah. I've been draining things lately. Yeah, you've been on your roll. And, 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 and the, the Mark thing. Lemke of... <laughs> yeah, there you go. You also lose to the twins. Yeah. Anyways... <laughs> Anyways, uh, and, and what's cool, I think, too, about the America Chavez thing is they've only released a trailer, and, you know, it's not like they come out in the trailer and say that she's an LGBTQ character, you know? So, like, there can be that worry, like, well, there's other characters they've introduced and they just don't mention it, like Dumbledore, like, they never mention in mm-hmm. the movies that he's gay. But they did, in the trailer, show her parents, who are a lesbian couple as well. So there's going to be some type of connection, at least there. So that's that's pretty cool. So good good on you, Marvel. That's uh, the way we should be going. So you are currently sitting at two to one. Yep. And we are moving on to question four. Okay. So the trailer for Creed 2 has landed. And we're not going to talk about that one today. Oh, okay, because I haven't seen it. It stars one of the greatest young actors we have in Michael B. Jordan. Okay. And one of the Your most... brother wants to, like, marry that dude. Yeah. And well, I thought I liked him a lot. He's a charming, handsome man. He I is. can understand that. Um, and it also stars one of the most Botoxed human ball sacks of an actor in Sylvester Stallone. hey The first Creed was a critical and financial success, and it also boasted critically acclaimed director Ryan Coogler, who wrote it, directed it, yeah, launched it off the does. ground, he's been great at everything. This one doesn't. This one does not. So, despite Jordan and Coogler, I've never been able to bring myself to watch Creed. 
And the only reason I've never been able to do it is because I've never seen a Rocky movie, and I'm sticking to my having never seen a Rocky movie. So even though I would probably enjoy it and everyone says it's good, I'm just stubbornly saying no. So what is a popular movie franchise? Titanic. What is a popular movie <laughs> franchise that you cannot bring yourself to watch? Titanic. I know it's not a franchise. Okay. Titanic. Why? Um, I made a uh, a promise with friend of the show, Jed, mm -hmm. that I would never watch Titanic because we were like, the, bo the boat sinks, this is stupid. And like it was starting to beat Star Wars for box office. He was like, no, fuck that. And so we promised to never watch that movie. Now, he went back on that promise, I, I believe. Oh, man. But I've stayed true. Your heart goes on. It's 20 years or whatever it's been since that movie's come out. Maybe 19 years. I don't really know. But what More I do than know 20 years, I believe. Is I don't give a shit because yeah. I never saw that movie and I ain't ever going to see that movie. Sorry, that is incorrect oh. because that is not a franchise. That yeah. is one movie yeah, that, don't care. that happened. Don't so, care. Staying true. Uh, but you you aren't missing out on anything oh, okay, good. by any standpoint. Especially, the only thing that's good about that movie is the music and the special effects. And I'm assuming the special effects probably don't look that amazing anymore 20 years later. So I, I like DiCaprio like as a rule. Yeah, but James Cameron writing dialogue as oh, a rule. Well, yeah, okay, yeah three enough. hours. Billy Zane in a... Central role, mm. yeah, it's, it's not. I didn't even know he was in it. Very, he's care. the villain. Oh, he's the the evil aristocrat that wants to marry Kate Winslet for her money and not pure love, like handsome hobo Leonardo DiCaprio does. With the aristocrat who already has money, wants yep, to... <laughs> he wants more. Wait, can't he can't get enough. <laughs> but like, he's an aristocrat, right? But he wants more. But she's more of one. She has the jewel or whatever she throws in the the ocean at the end. Oh, what the fuck that it's means. Pretty, pretty good movie. I don't care. Hey, yeah. I heard the ship sinks. It does sink, actually. Spoiler alert. It, it sinks, and the door could have easily hold two people, but for some reason, Leonardo DiCaprio doesn't get on it, and he yeah. drowns. In so. fairness, uh, one of my favorite movies is Captain America, the first Avenger, and there's about a billion ways that Steve Rogers <laughs> doesn't have to drive that thing into the iceberg, but he does anyway. So. He does. But uh, that was for the betterment of mankind, at least. Question five. The Dude. best reporter in all of MLS, Paul Tenorio, recently reported via The Athletic that MLS headquarters was currently considering reducing the amount of designated players a team could have from three players to two. Now, the designated player spot, once referred to as the Beckham Rule, allows a team to sign a player without the bulk of the contract counting towards the very minuscule salary cap that MLS uses. Proponents of the rule like that it brings better talent into the league, while opponents of the rule say that it takes playing time away from developing quality Americans and hurts the development of the U.S. national team player pool. What are your thoughts on cutting a designated player spot? I think this is kind of bullcrap because it's all in response to LAFC and Atlanta being super, super smart with the DP rule and going after young, talented players that they could play, pay more money to and the success of that. And basically, they did it better than anybody else did it, and it's sour grapes. Um, as far as the the national team, I think playing against better competition on a continual basis will help the national team overall. Does it take some play some spots from players? Perhaps, but it also raises the level of the league. And playing against good competition is what our players need to improve. I don't think our problems are from DP rules. I think our problems are Sunil Gulati. So well, he's gone. Yeah. So, know, but... so some of those things you said, I think, are spot on, and some of those I think are a little odd. I don't think the league is remotely bitter about what Atlanta and LAFC yeah. are doing. I think they are completely in love and promoting them and hoping that the two of them meet in the final because that is the best thing that could happen for the league. And I think they see what's happening with Joseph Martinez and Almiron and those guys as what you want because you're bringing in those good players, you're going to sell them, and that's going to raise the. The cal that it's going to raise the profile of the league for other good South American players who see a guy go to Atlanta United, then turn around and get sold to Europe for big bucks and play for good teams, which I think is going to happen with them. Uh, I, I think it might be a reactionary thing uh, revolving the national team, and, reg and I agree with you that I don't think it hurts the player pool either. But even if it does hurt the player pool, I don't fucking care. I want my club team, the Fire, to win an MLS Cup before we win the World Cup. Like, I will choose that in a heartbeat over us winning the World Cup. So if we can get more DPs and we can sign them, we'll probably sign the wrong ones because we're the fire. Hey, but yeah. I don't want to take away any tool that my team could use to win MLS Cup. Yeah. So I'm sorry, no point there. That's okay. I got a free one. 
you did get a free one, so this this balances it out. Maybe I'll reinsert the 311 one if it okay. seems like you're getting a little too ahead of yourself here. We already had a pavement one. I think it's only fair. Yeah, don't get cocky, flyboy. All right, <laughs> so where are we now? Let's see. I, I think uh, that was question five, and I think you are uh, in trouble here. I think you've got two points to uh, out of a possible five. So that means you need to... You got your, your shout-out, and you got your Kathleen Kennedy grade. But other than that, you've been missing out. Yeah. So, we'll go into question six. Okay. Two questions to go. You need them both. Yeah, the pressure's yeah. on. Is the answer Stanley Tucci? The answer? <laughs> wait, maybe. You just have to wait and see. Okay. You are allowed to guess that if you want. My favorite sports league, the NHL, is going to drop the puck uh, on a new season this week. And there's been some big player moves in the offseason. Eric Carlson is now Shark. John Traveris and Austin Matthews are set to take Toronto by storm. And my beloved Minnesota Wild made massive waves by signing solid 7th defenseman Greg Pattern. Maya Madrid, avid hockey fan. Oh. Guy who has already pledged earlier today how Maybe into more? the uh, NHL he is to, going to I'm be. going to watch some games. Who is going to win the Stanley Cup this year? Well... Yeah, I really wish I had a seventh question. And that this game's seven. This is six. I know, but I wish that this was going down to it. I'm trying to think of all the players and who were the top seeds last year. Um, fuck it, Toronto. Toronto's going to win. Austin Matthews is going to explode this year, and he's going to go crazy. And it's going to be Toronto. I was going to go with... Uh, LA because I like their goaltender a lot, but I can't remember his name. So. <laughs> Jonathan Quick. That's right. Well, the answer I had down is as long as you don't say Avalanche or Stars, I'll let you have. Oh point, my goodness! Fuck those teams. Am I, I totally wrong with the Maple Leafs? I just, no, they're not. They're not wrong. I think they need some decor help, but they have enough offensive help that they could trade for some decor help. For the record, and, my second team is the Habs, and so I know that that's bad. It will too. not be them. Just so well, you know, no, they're no, terrible. It's, yeah, they're not very they're good. Yeah, but, um, you know, I, I think the Maple Leafs have a good shot. They're going to have so much offense, and if they, they have the best coach in the league, I like Frederick Anderson uh, as a goaltender, and they'll, they'll, they might even be able to move Nylander and get a whole decor just off of Nylander alone. So who, do, who is the consensus pick, and who is your pick for the NHL? I don't know if there really is a consensus pick. I, I really like what the Sharks are doing. I really like the Eric Carlson pickup. Um, they're a team that's always floating around there, um, kind of reminiscent of the Capitals, and this could be the the year that they they get over the hump. So, I'll I'll go Sharks, but uh, I'll I'll throw it out there as much as I love the NHL, my preseason predictions are mainly garbage. Sure. We just looked at my MLS preseason predictions where I I picked Toronto to win the Supporter Shield and they aren't going to make the playoffs. I picked Orlando City to win the Open Cup and they're the second worst team in the entire league. I picked David Villa for the Golden Boot and Javinko for the MVP. So that's my preseason Sorry, predictions. But they beat uh, Mark Neitzel, who picked Chris Wondolowski to win the Golden Boot. So you did it. You managed to pull it to 3-3, which means we are down to one final question right. to get the answer. And this is actually sometimes we kind of have joke questions where we, we trap you into things mm -hmm. and whatnot. And this is not one of those. This is a legitimate I'm interested in what your thoughts are and we will see what it is. Because sticking with soccer, earlier this week, the Houston Dynamo won the U.S. Open Cup, their first ever U.S. Open Cup. <laughs> but like, if, if a Houston Dynamo team wins an Open Cup but nobody's there to see it, did they actually win? Second highest attended Open Cup final in history, actually. What? So, yeah, thir 13 or 14,000, which, wow. again, you wish the Open Cup could draw more, but yeah. that's uh, they've only been beaten by Seattle in attendance. Wow. For an Open right. Cup. So, I take it back, all our, all our fans in Houston. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, good for them. And titles aren't new to Houston. They have two stars above their crest. But they're, that's kind of a point of debate, right? Because the Houston Dynamo originally were the San Jose Clash, San Jose Earthquakes, the original MLS franchise who moved... And when they moved to Houston, what the league did was say that you're technically a expansion team, even though you get to keep all the players, coaches, infrastructure, all that type of thing. So the new San Jose team got to keep the two stars that Landon Donovan won. But that, technically... Does that make your brother really angry? That Landon Donovan? Yeah. No, he doesn't dislike Landon Donovan, mm -hmm. but he doesn't view him as a Quakes player, but he thinks the Quakes fans that hate him should move on yeah. but he also he came to the quakes after the new franchise came 
Mm-hmm. So I think he almost kind of views it like a separate entity. It's almost like, how would you, you know, as if you just start, like you being someone who kind of came to cheering for the wild, you know, like North Star history, what does that mm-hmm. mean to you? Like, I think it's kind of that way for him. But the question is, we've seen this in other leagues, right? Like the um, the Browns did the same thing, where like the Ravens took everything, but the Browns got to keep their name and colors and history and records and all those things. So in these situations, who do you think the history should remain? Should have should Houston have four stars because that organization won it? Four stars, or should the the stars won in San Jose stay with San Jose? Um, I think it's. It's a great question, and I, I, my my first answer is the wrong answer, and it's, I'm not really sure. But I, the way that I think that I feel is that if I'm a Sonics fan in Seattle, if I was a Cleveland fan in Cleveland, um, if I'm a San Jose Earthquakes fan, that that is that entity. And I think if you are moving your team, you are fundamentally changing that team. Uh, completely, and so I like the idea that they are expansion teams. Now it gets a little tricky because what happens when you move somewhere in state or something like that? You know, like when is a community not a community? Is the is the Arizona Cardinals moving to Glendale no longer part of the? You know, like yeah. I, I don't know what that what that means or or how that means, but um, I would say yeah. I mean, it's so should the Minnesota Timberwolves have the Lakers championship yes. banners? Yes. Okay. See, I, I disagree completely. Really? I think that an organization wins those, and an organization, just because an organization moved doesn't mean they didn't win those. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like, as as much as teams become part of the community and fabrics of the community, they aren't the community. Like, mm-hmm. the fans didn't win those titles. The Lakers organization won those titles. The Dynamo organization won those titles. Um, so I think they should move with them because I think it's disingenuous to say would, that your I'm, franchise has them. Yeah, I, I I wouldn't disagree. Again, like I said, I don't really know. Yeah. I think it's a sticky issue. What I would say is there there is no New Orleans Jazz anymore. Mm-hmm. That does not exist. So I don't think that the New Orleans Jazz ever won. But there is no Minneapolis Lakers anymore. There's the Los Angeles Lakers. And so... I don't know if the if, I don't know if the Timberwolves should get them either. Now I'm, I'm I realize that I'm kind of backtracking, but like, but what's the difference other than the name? Like, it, it's the name what gets the name is the the crucial crux that creeps it or keeps it because what you initially are saying is, you know, like the city is the one that's winning it or whatever. Mm. Well, the the NBA team was the Lakers, but they left, so then we got a new one. Mm-hmm. So then the new one should get it or you know should should the the whiz only have or the you know the the sporting kansas city only have one star because they aren't the wizards anymore and they won one title as the wizards yeah I don't know. you know like so th- for me this is how this is how i would do it i think organizations win titles and records so the titles and the records should transfer um so the the lakers should display the banners from minneapolis the the dynamo should display the two stars that were won in san jose but when teams move, I like names, logos, and colors staying in the city. Like, I like that they got to be the Earthquakes again mm-hmm. when they came back. I like that the Browns got to be the Browns again. Um, I don't like the fact that the Texans aren't the Oilers. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, like, again, and if they choose to not be that or whatever. Right. I mean, one of the most heartbreaking things I found out recently is that the NHL offered the Wild North Stars and they said no. They wanted to do their own thing. Which is disappointing because that what a great name and logo that was. But and I think it would be awesome to have the stars and the North Stars. Yeah, that would be. Yeah, no, I think it would have been. It would have been a what I would have wanted mm-hmm. ideally. I mean, and the Jets, you know, the the Jets, you know, like the Jets never won anything, but like you know, the Jets moved to you know you have that whole interchange of the Jets were the Jets in Winnipeg, and now they're the Coyotes, and then you have the Thrashers in Atlanta. And they're now the Jets in Winnipeg. So, I, you know, I think titles move would should move with organizations. The only place I do like where they kind of redid it is the Ottawa Senators. Because the Ottawa Senators came in in the 90s in the NHL, and they were named after an, ex, an old team, you know, from the late 1800s, early 1900s, called the Ottawa Senators, who won eight Stanley Cups. And they display the Stanley Cup banners in there, but that organization ceased to exist. Yeah. So it's not like it went... 
somewhere else. Um, so th that's the one instance where I kind of like them displaying the championship banners. But normally I would, I would vote no. And I, you know, I would also say, you know, that, that gives the twins a third World Series title then too in 1913. So, go. hey, <laughs> that's something. <laughs> so, oh, I suppose I have to give you a point for this. Oh, do you? You disagreed, so you didn't get the point. Oh. That was question seven. We needed a tiebreaker. Oh, I thought so. you were going to still give me the point the way that you... I was not. Cause... So I was not expecting the point, and then you said that and got my hopes up that I was going to get... Yeah, well, I did, I did, you know, deliver a verdict. And the verdict is no point for you, sir, oh, because I, uh, I disagree with you. But it's an interesting kind of fun topic. It is. So nice job. Train harder next week so you can yeah. come at this better. Disappointed in you, man. Well, it's, you know, I was on a good run there for a while. And... <laughs> Gotta prep yourself for Mark. I I'm gonna kick his ass. Nice, nice. Okay, do we have questions? I think our only question is uh, when can you start? Right now. Let's do it. My goodness, yes. Uh, let's get to that. I gotta unlock my phone here. Where it's been a few weeks since we has. did this. Hey, um, it may show. Hey, maybe you're out there feeling lonely. Perhaps you've always wanted to hear about Luke's. Hello. Put that in there. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you're drawn to the lazy surfer aesthetics of my voice. Maybe you just need someone to talk to. Maybe you were going to write in for the other person who's supposed to be here. Is it you I'm looking for? <laughs> And uh, then they don't. But like John Lennon said, if you're lonely, you can talk to me. Email the show, tweet the show, immerse yourself in the show. Friend of the show, Jed, wrote in a specific question for our friend who did not show tonight, um, who was a financial mastermind. And Jed wrote, dear uh, friend of the show, please elucidate upon the well-known belief that you must spend money to make money. And uh, our friend is not here to answer that question, but uh, you are, so... Um, Okay, so I have to come up with an answer. I guess, so, yeah, I'm I guess, this. Okay, so. uh, an, an example of how you have to spend money to make money, I think, would be um, you know, looking at assets that you can get in at a good value, get a lot of return and reward out of for you, and then pass on to someone else for more than they're worth so that when they give you value, it decreases. So you may find, like, I don't know, a young Chilean forward with a lot of pluck and vinegar, but he might be playing at a team where he's he's not getting a lot of playing time because they're one of the best teams in the world and you're able to offer him a lot of starting time. So you bring him over to your team and he's by far the leading scorer on your team and he, he leads you to three FA Cups and he's a great fit, but he's kind of feisty and he loves his dogs and he's a little odd. So you kind of realize the door might be, be shutting on, on keeping this guy around and you might not get the big bucks you wanted in the exact time you were going to sell him, but you're able to trade him for a very solid, uh, another underused player who can really, you know, link up with your new forward and, and become a great combo. So you, you send him on to another team that just kind of likes to buy shiny things because mm -hmm. they're out there and, you know, has a three-year plan that never finishes three years because that guy gets fired at the end of every three years. And so you're able to pass him along and, um, you know, you, you're sitting in five consecutive wins and, you know, you're looking at that Champions League spot and meanwhile the guy you just dumped... Uh, you know, he's, what, scored two goals and can't even get off the bench, you know, against West Ham. So, you know, there we, we spent some money, but we made a lot of money off those FAA Cups. And then I, it looks like we made more money by dumping him when we did. So that that's, you know, I'm not a business a good... guy, but I feel like that worked out pretty well. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I'm going to take that and I'm going to go invest. Yeah. And no one's going to tweet back at me about this, I bet, either. So Never. that's exciting. That would be <laughs> exciting. Hey, Luke. Hey, what? I saw a trailer. In fact, I saw a couple of trailers. One is Captain Marvel, and the other is Dark Phoenix. Which one do you want to talk about first? I think we should start with Captain Marvel. All right, that's what I have first, so very good. Tell me, what were your thoughts on that? I am very excited for this. Me too. I, I didn't really know what to think. That's not a character I'm overly familiar with. I certainly have nothing against. I am excited that they were jumping into a female lead for the first time, and I like Brie Larson. Um, but I have to say, with all the hype for Infinity War and all that type, uh, with that big event movie coming up, I haven't thought about Captain Marvel much, and I've kind of for forgot about it for a little bit. Um, and, you know, she got that teaser at the end of Infinity War, which was Spoiler. exciting. Yeah, but it's not, you know, it's not like you saw Brie Larson or anything like that. So to finally get the first images of the movie, it looked really good. Like, the effects looked great. She looked great in costume. 
The scrolls looked really good. Um, <laughs> her punching a grandma was awesome. Exactly, and I, I, I wonder in my head, like, do they, they, they knew what they were doing with that, right? Did they, they knew that would rile people up who didn't understand, and because that gets people talking about the trailer, and everyone who knows anything about a scroll knows exactly what's happening mm. there or whatever. She's not running around beating old women just to beat old women, but. Um, it, it's a moment that shocks people, and that's the type of thing you want in a trailer. So I, this got me excited, and you get a little bit of the backstory, but I don't feel like I know the whole plot. It's, you don't know everything. It's not Spider-Man Homecoming, where it felt like beat for beat I knew everything from the trailer. So this this is exactly what I want in a trailer, and it got me really excited for it. The, the biggest drawback in my head being a massive Green Lantern fan was I went, damn it, they're going to do a better Green Lantern movie now than DC has been able to do with a fighter pilot becoming a space cop. But Well, um, the obvious comparison is going to be to Wonder Woman and ultimately in how we view this movie after it comes out. And I think that's a good place to be. And that, even though I didn't care for the Wonder Woman movie for... Because um, you hate women. <laughs> I don't hate women. Uh, I have two in my household, and they're pretty awesome. Um, I I didn't like Wonder Woman because of some like technicalities, not because of what it did for for movies. And, I, and I'm happy that it did well, and I'm happy that people really really enjoyed it. And it's quite honestly taken far too long for Marvel to do this. We should have a Black Widow movie by now. Um, but it does come at a good time in the Marvel timeline because they need some like big guns to like help them against Thanos and however this all um, finishes they also need um, someone to lead whatever happens after Avengers and with these new Avengers there's going to have to be a leader and I think Captain Marvel is the perfect character for that Um, I like the look I I buy her as Captain Marvel I think the movie looks great visually and Marvel's done such a good job of condensing down the characters to like a pure essence and presenting that on screen and it's a, they have a really good track record, but that's my my only worry is that her whole story is like ups and downs, and if they try to do everything, I could see that that um, backfiring a little bit. But even as I say that, that's what they've been so good at. So um, you just kind of have to put your trust in that. Ultimately, to me, uh, Captain Marvel is a much more interesting character than Wonder Woman, and. Um, that kind of goes in with Marvel versus DC. I, I have grown to like Marvel characters more, uh, which wasn't the truth when, or wasn't the case when you and I first we met. We flip flop. Yeah, we both flip flop. Um, but I just, I really, really like um, this character. I think the time is now, and I think it's going to be absolutely amazing. Well, what I would say as someone who, who loves Wonder Woman, the movie, is that it, it's not fair to either of those movies. Like, we shouldn't look at them as how Captain Marvel is in comparison to Wonder Woman. That's how it's... I'm just saying that's yeah. how it's going to be. But, like you, know, you know, and, and that shouldn't be the the bar for anyone. Like, the, the one thing I really don't want out of this movie is for people to come out and it's... The ranking is either above or below Wonder Woman. Like, just how good a movie it is mm-hmm. is what should matter. Um, and and I, what I think is nice about it is that I'm sure there'll be elements that are the same. And obviously they're both, you know, female characters kind of in new worlds from the look of it. Or whatnot, but they are drastically different stories from the look of it. You know, time, character, all those things. So I, I, I think we should try to avoid those comparisons as much as possible and just enjoy this on what it is. What did you think of of '90s setting? Um, it's it's. I think th- it was weird to me only because, and I knew that that was. I mean, that's been the case since the production. Everybody kind of knew that that was what it was going to be. So I wasn't surprised. Yeah. Um, but just how it looked and everything. I, well, I was a little let down. I mean, the, the the 90s look, I didn't feel 90s except for the blockbuster. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's 90s. No. And I think it's, I think the putting it in the 90s is just how they're trying to get around her not being around before. Like, she's been gone since the 90s. And I think that's kind of a shoehorn thing. But we'll, we'll know when the movie comes out, you know. I, I, I wasn't, I was kind of let down. I wanted it more 90s. I don't know if I wanted, like, Rachel from Friends to like pop out and do a little dance, but yeah, well, I, and I agree um, that I felt like it didn't. F- the only thing about it that felt '90s was they showed a blockbuster. Like all the other scenes, I kind of forgot it was set in the '90s because everyone is, 
you know, and a lot of it's the people in space or whatever, mm-hmm. but like how, you know, Brie Larson of Terror and all those things, it's not like any of that jumped out at me and was like, this is the 90s, no. like, you she know, She should have gone thing. with, like, the, 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 like, the high in the back and, the, like, the low... Yeah. The, the and, classic and I'm, Friends haircut. The, I, I'm sure there'll be tons more references to 90s. You know there'll mm. be, you know, giant cell phones or the replaceable snap face cell phones that everyone had and stuff. But, yeah, it felt to me like they were just like, here's a blockbuster and Samuel L. Jackson is young. Mm-hmm. Um, even though he doesn't look that old normally. To be honest, anyway, it didn't look that much different. I I don't think it's necessarily shoehorned. I think it's nice to have a character. Uh, it, it's a time frame that we've never dealt with mm-hmm. in this universe. Like nothing has been set in the '90s. We've had stuff before the '90s, and we've had definitely stuff after. So this is a time period they can explore where you don't have to be like, well, if Captain Marvel was here, why didn't she just go stop Ultron? Right. You know, so it, it's a time space they can play with that hasn't been explored, which which works for me, I think, especially to have her show up in Avengers 4 and, mm-hmm. and kick ass. Like, she can't, we can't go through her whole backstory in Avengers 4 and, or, you right. know, have her find her powers in Avengers 4 and be a big player. So it works for me. My other question on it is, Obviously, we know Coulson's in it, and we know Sam Jackson's in it, and we've also seen whatever Jaiman Huntsu's character is that was in Guardians of the Galaxy and Ronan from Guardians of the Galaxy. You know there's some cameos that they haven't shown us. So who who would be a 90s, a character that'd be available for a, a cameo in the 90s? Like, is it baby Tony, you know, child Tony Stark? Could be. Um, Hank Pym, Ant-Man. Thor. Thor, yeah, Thor could be one. Yeah, anyone from there could be. Um, Michael Rooker and Star Lord could yeah. technically be in there, especially out in space, and, and Kree. But you know, there's gonna be there's gotta be there's gotta be some other cameo that they're not. I would like them to do something like way out of the ordinary too, like like Moon Knight or just something like. Oh, that'd be fun. Like something that you weren't expecting at all, and that they don't have plans for. I mean, I guess they have plans for everybody, but or just something that like you might pick up on as a more dedicated Marvel fan that, like, I wouldn't even notice. Like, you know... Speedball, dude. In there. Straight I up do, Speedball. I do know Speedball. Speedball, I would be all about it. Well, and he was friends with Nova, so it would make, it would make, make sense, sense if you threw him up there. So does this trailer make you more or less likely to want to see this movie? I'm going to see this movie either way. Okay. So, so like, I was like, going to see it like either, the but this, this movie made me more yeah. want to see it. Which is a contrast to the next trailer. Oh, really? What are we going to talk about next, Luke Knightel? That would be the Dark Phoenix oh, God. trailer, which I did not like. No. At all. And I liked it, the trailer, but I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, see, and I didn't. I had lots of problems. I, I like this young cast, even though X-Men Apocalypse was awful. So I, I was kind of, I'm kind of excited for them, but I'm not big on Kinberg. I don't have a lot of faith in anything that's happened with this movie going right, and not to make fun of a movie you like, but mm-hmm. hype wise, it seems very mm-hmm. soloish as far as what's been oh, I going, you were going on. Going a with different that. direction, okay? Oh, I'm, I'm Fantastic Four. I actually talk about solo oh. in my notes and Fantastic Four. Okay, Four-ish. yeah. So it, it felt like that, and obviously Kinberg was involved in Fantastic Four. My biggest complaints about this is that the storyline feels like they're rehashing the Dark Phoenix as told in X Men: The Last Stand. Like, like exactly. Yeah. Like, I don't want to see Professor X suppress her and lie to her and then her rage comes out and, and stuff. Like, I I was so disappointed. And we know they're going to space. They've told us that or whatever. So I'm hoping the Phoenix Force is, a, like, a cosmic Phoenix Force, like it's the actual gonna, comic. Yeah, but like this was really disappointing that they were just trying to say, we wrote a really great last stand, but Brett Ratner screwed it up, so we're just redoing the last stand. And I'm really worried now that's what we're getting. Yeah. Look, I know I said a lot of times that it doesn't really matter that we might not need a solo movie, that I was happy with what came out of it. And I used to have arguments with Fred of the show, Jed. He always would say that we didn't need a Batman Begins movie. He felt, because it was so soon, like, we saw that. He just kept saying, we saw that movie already. And so I've always been on that, no, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, um, to, to rehash these things or to redo these things. But dear God, it's the same damn movie. Yeah. It's the same thing. And Simon Kimberg, as you said, he was behind all the parts of X3 as a producer. And now he's behind, he, recently he was under behind all the parts of the Fantastic Four movie that I didn't like. I love the first half of that movie. And then everything that he did to it made me want to like 
gouge out my eyeballs. I have no confidence. I think he's obsessed with this story, but hasn't shown a real interest in building up the world that made it important and made it special. Like, when you read that comic, it's like laying groundwork for two flipping years. And why that is so emotionally resonant with the readers is because of how you have Jean willing to sacrifice herself. And, and, and Cyclops is a huge part of that story. And they haven't done the legwork that they did in X2 to, to, get, to pull it off this time around. We loved that character in Jean Grey because she sacrificed herself to save everybody else. And she, you know, we barely know this Jean Grey, like, at all. And they tried to pull it off in, like, Apocalypse, and it was real. I mean, it was cool looking, and it was cool if you liked the character Jean, but it, it really didn't hold the emotional weight. And there's no emotional weight for Cyclops at all. Like, I have no, I, I don't like Ty Sheridan as Cyclops, and I don't not like Ty Sheridan as Cyclops. I have no freaking clue what kind of Cyclops he is, because he was just an afterthought. And the, the most interesting part about X-Men Apocalypse was those new kids, and we just pushed them to the side. And now we're supposed to believe she's so tortured? Why? Because she had three lines in a movie? I just, I don't know. So my my wonder on this is, is this trailer design, maybe they are going more cosmic. We do know they go into space. We don't know who Jessica Chastain is playing, but it sounds like she's not a Skrull. But it sounds like she might be a cosmic character. Is this trailer more of a misdirect for casual fans who they don't want to bombard with aliens and cosmic uh, stuff? You're giving them a lot of credit. Yeah, that is true. I think that they just really want to show tortured Gene, and they're doing it all over again. But the difference is we cared about that Gene Grey, and we don't know this one. Now, I like Sophie Turner. And I like her as Jean. Like I think she's gonna do a good job. But man, if she like lets up at all, like like Jennifer Lawrence did in the most recent movie, like this could be a train wreck. And and the rumors coming out is that it's unwatchable. Yeah, yeah. Well, see, I was also kind of taken aback by how ill fitting the X costumes look. Mm -hmm. Like they just look overstuffed. They almost look like when my kids buy superhero Halloween costumes and they have like the fake muscles mm -hmm. built in and that was really disappointing because I my favorite part of Apocalypse is them standing in their comic accurate uniforms at the end and they they, they, they went with the using Morrison those. ones like the more you know like from the Morrison run and yeah. like and I get that's what they're doing but they just they look as bad as like I did not like the art from the Morrison run so. but they, and they look clunky like yeah. they just look like they're awkward and they can't move in them and it it was a weird design now I'm not gonna be all negative. Right. Um, there are things that um, I liked about it. There's a particular shot where apparently Jean kills her parents, mm -hmm. um, which is crazy. But uh, with the glass shattering and then her stopping all the glass like in front of her face. So there were some action sequences like that that I liked. It does seem like the X-Men are going to divide into a couple groups based on the shots there. And I so that was interesting to see how they might split apart um, in different lines. And I, I love Jessica Chastain, so I'm willing to give her the the benefit of the doubt that she'll at least be entertaining, though I would have said the same thing about Oscar Isaac, too, going into Apocalypse, and he was not interesting or entertaining in that movie. You are all my children. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that... Oh, yeah. Let's not talk about that movie anymore. Um, <laughs> it's not as bad as X3, dude. No, it's not as bad as X3, but it's not good. No, it's not good. It's not good at all. And I liked it coming out. Remember, I was like, oh... This is okay. It's pretty good. And it's just, that was wishful thinking. Yeah. It's, it's real bad. It's, it's real, real bad. And so maybe the bar is so low that this can't be worse than Last Stand or. But the bar was so high with the first two movies of this generation. X-Men First Class, I maintain, is an awesome movie. And Days of Future Past is up there with some of the best movies uh, in this universe. Um, I, I put probably three just off the top of my head with X2 and Logan being added. And Deadpool, obviously, I didn't have oh, Deadpool. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I'm not looking forward to this. I'm not excited. I will still go with you uh, because that's what we do we unless do you're go going with movies. Jim. No, no, I told you I would stay with you for X-Men movies okay. if I have to. So, yeah. Well, and we have till summer now or until it gets pushed back again. But, yeah, this this trailer Wait, it got me... pushed back to summer? I thought yeah, it got pushed really... Push, that was, they just announced they got pushed back to summer. Hey, did you see that the Gambit movie is going to be a romantic comedy? Yeah, good luck with that. That's going to be so good. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. It's, they're never going to make it. I like, they're, 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 they'd have to get it under production 
so quickly before this merger happens, and I feel like Marvel's just gonna be like, no, nah, we're we're good without this. So I mean, you know, and the same thing with these X Men, like. Even if this movie's the best movie that ever comes out, we're probably done with this cast of X-Men. It's interesting because, you know, they're they're setting the the idea of um, this being, like, the end because, like, Jean's going to go crazy and, like, the end of the team, she's going to destroy everything. And they're using the end by, um, I don't know who did the cover, but obviously, like, from Apocalypse Now. Um, the Doors. From The Doors. And, um, really, I kept thinking i surely hope so i hope this is the end and do you want to hear my amazing conspiracy theory i What's just that? thought of with the movie being pushed back to summer what if at the end of infinity war 4 they interdimensionally open into the x-men world and they merge the two worlds and that's why it's happening after infinity war 2 that would be the stupidest that would be thing terrible would be a, yeah. absolutely you know terrible. who would have come up with that idea simon kinberg he would have and he's probably and, pitching it right now and you know what you know who's just telling him go fuck yourself it's kevin feige yes <laughs> that, yes he is so that sounds goodbye like my, sounds like one of my ideas <laughs> no you'll be really good and you gotta shut it, up it sounds it sounds like on parks and recreation when they had uh pat, pat oswald filibuster and all he talks about is how he would bring the marvel characters into star wars <laughs> So that's exactly what that idea is. So yeah, this is good night to these X-Men characters, and this trailer made me less likely to want to see it. Oh, they started off so good. Oh, well. Let's move to some other nerd news. I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. First, po- first podcast, Luke, that I ever loved was the BS Report with Bill Simmons. And the one that I've listened to most is the college football podcast from ESPN. And it was at its best with Ivan Mazel and Bino Cook. But the best podcast I've ever listened to is Serial. Sarah Koenig's show just started with season three after a huge wait. In the first season, there was a deep dive into the murder of Heyman Lee, uh, which ultimately is going to lead to a new trial for Adnan Sayed. The second season analyzed Bo Bergdahl's desertion from the military in Afghanistan, while this season is focused on the criminal justice system in Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland was chosen not for any particular reason other than it's big and would let uh, Koenig record. The first episode dealt with a young woman who was sexually harassed, then assaulted, and ultimately physically attacked when she struck a police o- or where she then went on to struck, strike a police officer on accident. The second episode was about a judge who. And this is kind of tough to describe. He essentially is like a dad who does all the wrong things to children despite evidence that it's not working and whose kids ultimately realize that the best way to deal with him is just to tell him what they, what they think he wants to hear. The most recent episode discusses the way that the prosecution and police can work together to twist a story and get the results they want regardless of justice. And so, um, I've been all about this. I had listened to it right away when it comes out. Want to hear your thoughts so far on the third season of cereal. Oh, it's fascinating, and I can't get enough of it. And I've I've had a blast listening to these first three episodes. I was a little weary at first with the format change of it not being like one straight story, but I think this has been a great way to go. And this is just as compelling as a lot of the other stuff they've done on the other seasons. And it's equal parts terrifying um, as well as fascinating just hearing these stories about how our justice system actually works on kind of a data day scale because a lot of these stories and these things you hear are things that could happen to you or could happen to your friends like you don't really realistically think what happened to Bo Bergdahl or Adnan Syed can happen to you like we're not going to be in those situations and we probably won't be in most of these hopefully but they're the things that you hear and see that happen to your friends and just how far down that that rabbit hole of 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 just bureaucracy and and uh and and little things that that can derail lives but to prosecutors and judges and police don't seem like a big deal it's it's crazy and it's fascinating and what what i've really come to appreciate isn't just the the stories they bring to you but just what a good storyteller she is Mm -hmm. like in comparison to everyone else in the podcast medium and besides us well besides us yeah obviously but and and take away all the people who are kind of just amateurs. Like I listen to other podcasts that are done by you know professional journalists, like Criminal, um, or you know Up and Vanished, which is a documentary filmmaker. And though I'm not trying to discount those people, but they're very good. Podcasts. They're very yeah, they're very good. And but they're just like she is able to tell a story, 
and make it sound so natural and so professional and so well done. But yeah, I mean, it's it really just blows me away. I've listened to each episode twice, and the first time I'm listening to the story, and the second time I'm just listening to how well she is able to bring you in and around the story in the way she wants and to make it seem so natural. Mm-hmm. One of the things that came out to me is is kind of like when, in this case, government, but when business is trying to be efficient and the sacrifices that are made for efficiency is one of the things that stuck out to me about that I find fascinating because you have this huge criminal justice system that says that it protects people's rights but punishes people for ex- ex- exercising its rights. It's much better to just plead out yeah. and uh, much quicker. And if you put up any fight, you know, from you know, any fight at all, then you're going to be a target for them. And it's also amazing to me how much people in authority can pretty much do whatever they want. Cops and prosecutors can angle their way out of pre- police brutality. A judge can do whatever he wants with no oversight. I and mean, it's because people don't pay attention to local elections. He just gets away with it. Yeah. Justice isn't really something anyone seems at all concerned with in this show. I actually went up um, and I looked for Judge Gall is his name. And I looked at his Cleveland Bar Association ratings. And... Um, he received a 3.5 out of 4 by local Cleveland Bar Associations. The breakdown was uh, he got a good from the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association. The Cuyahoga County Criminal Defense Lawyers Association listed him as excellent. Norman S. Bar, uh, Norman S. Minor Bar Association was excellent. And the Ohio Women's Bar Association listed him as good. And I was like, holy <laughs> shit. That's terrifying. What is bad? Yeah. Because that guy is terrible. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you know, even if they ranked him poor, it wouldn't matter because voters don't research. They right. just pick whatever name. Well, he's in fairness. There, I'm so. a Democrat. He's a Democrat. Cleveland is a Democratic city. People are just voting for him because he's a Democrat. Yeah, they yeah. see that on there and this. But yeah, well, and I, yeah, people people vote for the the R or the D or the name they think is funny or the name that they just saw on a sign mm-hmm. because someone bothered to put up. A sign. That's why incumbency, regardless of party, you know what incumbents win basically mm-hmm. almost all the time, because um, we don't bother to do the time or the research and look into what we're doing, and that leads to these people thinking they can do whatever they want. Because who is going to stop them? I mean, you even hear from the other judges who disagree with him and can tell some of the things he's done are really unethical, but they don't even want to really go on record to talk bad about him. No, because then he's going to screw him. Yeah, exactly. So, no, it's really really eye-opening, and I like that they they took this approach of saying, these other cases we've done are extraordinary. They don't tell us anything about the criminal justice system, so we're going to look at what the ordinary is, and, man, the ordinary is way worse Mm. than the extraordinary. It's Um, fucking awful. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I will, you know, I don't, I don't think anything they do is ever going to beat season one for me. This is probably a better journalistic achievement so far, and we're only three episodes in. But the mystery of season one and, like, all that is is so compelling that it's hard to beat, but I already like this better than season two. Yeah, I was going to ask you, because I enjoyed season two, mm-hmm. but I didn't, but a lot of people, it seems like they didn't. And, um, you know, it's obviously a step down, but everything was going to be at that point what what did you think of season two i think i think season two is interesting but it's it's not a mystery like i think what's so compelling about season one is just trying in your head to figure out and then you you know everyone was into it so comparing theories with friends of what they think he did or didn't do or you know everyone kind of you know we did that a bunch mm-hmm. like sharing you know having discussions being like that oh. dude's straight up guilty oh yeah I think. I, I think he is guilty too but what they convicted him on is right. is completely wrong and Stuff, but you know, having those those debates with people is fun, and the Bergdahl case is interesting, and there's so much I didn't know about it, and but it's not a it's not a mystery. It's just this is what happened. Here are the the two sides. You know, should he be punished? So they're a different type of story, and I'm always going to gravitate towards the mystery. And yeah. then when it comes to season two versus season three, um, so far I'm just liking season three more because you know. Again, the Bergdahl thing seems so far from my reality that um, th- this feels, you know, closer to home. And, I, you know, I'm not, you know, I've never been convicted of a crime other than, you know, a traffic, you know, speeding tickets and stuff like that. But 
Um, you know, these are the things that your friends or family could be dealing with and to see how crazy the, the system really is just on the normal level is, um, horribly compelling emphasis on horrible. Okay. Uh, speaking of what's been horrible and compelling, that's the end of this show. Maybe just horrible. Luke, where can they find you? <laughs> uh, Luke underscore night. So on Twitter, that's Twitter. Yeah. Hey, friend of the show, where can they find you? And me, I'm Maya Madrid. I can be found at Maya Madrid on Twitter. We are kids seriously, at least two thirds or one half or some other fraction. Uh, speaking of, I like to say four sixths. That's great. Bye. <laughs>